Here's a quick overview of the urea cycle, a process that allows your body to dispose of nitrogen groups from amino acids safely so that you don't have Windex veins, you don't have ammonia in your blood. Instead, what you do with those nitrogen groups is generate urea, which the kidneys can excrete in the urine. It takes place in the liver, and it involves reactions happening in the mitochondria and in the cytoplasm. It's pretty cool, but pretty complicated looking. So here's just a quick walkthrough, and I have a much more detailed version if you want more. The key thing to focus on is the fact that you're going to be taking two amino acids that travel to the liver on the form typically of glutamine or alanine, as we'll discuss. In the liver, these amino groups are then going to get incorporated into this molecule called urea and get excreted. For each turn of the urea cycle, you're taking two amino groups and you are removing them as urea. This is also going to leave you with carbon skeletons of the amino acids. And then we get into talking about what can we actually do with those carbon skeletons. For each turn of the cycle, we're going to need to bring in two amino acids because we're going to need two amino groups to make urea. These two amino acids can be coming from the bloodstream. And remember, those could be coming from any amino acid. Typically, then, the amino groups will be passed on to make glutamine or to make alanine that transfer to the blood to your liver. In the liver, one of these amino groups is going to get passed on to alpha-ketoglutarate to give you glutamate. And then this can happen in the mitochondria or this can happen in the cytoplasm. But one way or another, that glutamate is going to get into the mitochondria. And then the amino group is going to get released as ammonia. We'll get back to this in a minute. The other second amino acid is also going to transfer an amino group onto alpha-ketoglutarate to give you glutamate. But now this glutamate is going to get passed onto oxaloacetate to give you aspartate. So you kind of have two, these two, these two pass-offs. These transaminations can happen in the cytoplasm or in the mitochondria. And so you can have the amino acids travel through. And therefore, these transaminations can happen either place, but one way or another, you've got to end up with a glutamate in your mitochondria and an aspartate in your cytoplasm, because part of the cycle is going to take place in the cytoplasm, the part that takes the amino group from an aspartate, and then the other part, the part that takes the amino group from a glutamate, is going to happen in your mitochondria, or at least the part where it takes the amino group from a glutamate with an oxidative deamination that we'll talk about. Whereas here, we're doing a transamination. Here, we're going to do something called an oxidative deamination. And so we'll talk about that. But remember that you have two amino acid groups coming in, two amino groups being passed. Those two amino groups are ultimately going to be released as urea. And now we just have to figure out the logistics to make that happen. Note, too, that in the next few minutes of the video, I accidentally was using a figure where the NAD plus and the NADH were switched. Remember that malate reacts with NAD plus to give you oxaloacetate and NADH. Oxaloacetate is the more oxidized form. This is an oxidation reaction going from malate to oxaloacetate. It needs NAD plus. The reverse, going from oxaloacetate to malate, is a reduction reaction that uses NADH. So I didn't wasn't able to fix in post-production the swappage on those couple slides or a couple minutes or whatever because I was moving the screen around. So thanks for understanding. It should be like this. So we have aspartate, and so that was made with aspartate transaminase, and then we have our glutamate, which we made by various transaminases. So we have two nitrogen groups, one on each of these, and we can have gotten those amino groups from any amino acid. So what we're going to do is that this glutamate is going to get oxidatively deaminated. So you're going to do an oxidation reaction to cut off that nitrogen-containing group as ammonia. Overall, we kind of call this process transdeamination. We're transaminating from an amino acid onto alpha-ketoglutarate to give us glutamate, and then oxidatively deaminating the glutamate to give us alpha-ketoglutarate and our ammonia. And yes, we don't want free-floating ammonia hanging around, but this is happening in our liver, in the mitochondria, in this controlled manner where it's going to quickly react with bicarbonate in this reaction that uses ATP and generates this highly energetic uh, molecule called carbamoyl phosphate.
That's happening with the help of carbon monophosphate synthetase one, which is going to be a regulatory point, kind of like the main regulatory point, other than just controlling concentrations, its production is regulated by arginine. So this whole process is kind of indirectly regulated by arginine. You have this molecule called carbon oil phosphate, which if you look at it, what we have here is kind of this activated amide. So remember a nitrogen group next to a carbonyl, that's an amide. And it's now it's attached to a phosphate group. So that's gonna be a kind of place at which we can link this up somewhere else. Where we're gonna link this up somewhere else is onto the end of this molecule called ornithine. If you look at ornithine, well, it looks like arginine, but it's missing kind of the end group of arginine. If you look at the end of group of arginine, well, that looks a lot like urea. If you just think about kind of like adding a water and chopping this end off of arginine, you get urea and you're left with ornithine. This is what we're gonna do. But in order to actually make the arginine, what we're gonna need to do is we're going to need to add two amino groups. And we're gonna get one of those amino groups from our glutamate that we have coming in over here and then one of the amino groups from our aspartate. So what's gonna happen is that the ornithine is going to join with the amide group from our carbon monophosphate. And then this is going to, with the help of ornithine transcarboid bamylase, and this will give us citrulline. Now the citrulline can transport out of the mitochondria. And this next part is gonna happen in the cytoplasm. So we're gonna see this kind of antiport, this co-transport where citrulline is going to get passed out, ornithine is going to get passed in, this ornithine carrier translocase. The citrulline now in the cytoplasm can join up with the amino group from aspartate. And this, we're going to do it in this really awkward manner using this molecule called arginosusinate synthetase. As the name suggests, we're going to be synthesizing a molecule called arginosusinate, and this arginosusinate is this really, really awkward looking thing. Basically, what's happening is that instead of transferring the amino group like we've transferred amino groups from place to place, we're actually going to kind of stick this whole aspartate onto citrulline, onto the side of citrulline, in the place of this where this carbonyl is, we're going to stick on this whole aspartate. And this is going to give us this arginosusinate. It's going to be energetically costly. It's going to cost us an ATP, but it's almost like it costs us two ATP because we're hydrolyzing it to AMP rather than ADP. So it would take us two ATPs in order to regenerate this. But we end up with this molecule, arginosusinate. This molecule does not like being this awkward. And so arginosusinase is going to help us kind of like break off, break off the part of the aspartate except for the amino group. So that'll give us fumarate. And then we can take the rest of it. So now we have the amino group added on, we have our arginine. And now we can break off the end of arginine like we were talking about before. We can hydrolyze it with arginase Use water to kind of break that off, give us urea. That urea can now go to your kidneys and get excreted in your urine. What you've done is you've taken two amino groups and you safely removed them as urea. Voila. You're also left back with ornithine that can go back into the mitochondria in exchange for new citrulline. And then you could do this process over and over. Each time you're going to be bringing in two amino groups, which are coming from a variety of different sources, but then kind of come from glutamate or aspartate. But the amino group themselves could have been transferred there from, a bar, from pretty much any amino acid. So let's think about how we can keep this cycle going. Remember that we had those two amino acids bringing in amino groups, and then those amino groups are going to get passed on to alpha-ketoglutarate to give you glutamate. Ammonia was going to be taken from one of those glutamates, leaving you back with alpha-ketoglutarate. This alpha-ketoglutarate is now ready to accept another amino group, and so we're good on that front. What else are we going to need, however? In order to pass this amino group on, another amino group on down here, we're going to need another alpha-ketoglutarate in a similar situation. However, when we take the amino group from the glutamate and then take it onto aspartate, we then take the whole aspartate and add that onto citrulline. We're not just removing the amino group. So we're actually taking all these carbons into the cycle, and then those carbons get removed as fumarate. 
So we're going to need another oxaloacetate if we want to keep this going. We need an oxaloacetate where we can pass the amino group onto in order to give aspartate. We regenerated our alpha-ketoglutarate so we can make glutamate up here. And we're going to regenerate this alpha keto glute right here where we pass the amino group onto oxaloacetate to make aspartate. But then we're going to take that whole aspartate away. And so we won't have this oxaloacetate regenerated. So we need to regenerate that oxaloacetate. In the citric acid cycle, we know that we can go from fumarate to malate using fumarase and then malate to oxaloacetate using malate dehydrogenase. And we actually have those enzymes in the cytoplasm. But in the citric acid cycle, they're happening in the mitochondria. So if you want to use this fumarate to make oxaloacetate in the cytoplasm, you can, but that's not going to be a simple link to your tricarboxylic acid cycle. So although sometimes you might see this thing called like Krebs bicycle, where you have oxaloacetate siphoned off from the citric acid cycle connected to the urea cycle and just have this like continuous loop, Although that like energetically works in terms of just kind of keeping a balance and a figure on a piece of paper, it's not practically useful because the fumarate is in the wrong place. We don't have transporters for fumarate to get into the mitochondria. So the fumarate is not just going to be going into the mitochondria, going through your citric acid cycle, and then you take the oxaloacetate out. You could make the oxaloacetate out in the cytoplasm and use it there. But there's probably better things you want to do with that oxaloacetate that you make out here. Because you have this oxaloacetate out here and the liver, and the liver has other things it can do with the oxaloacetate. The, ox the liver can take this a step further. The liver can do gluconeogenesis. It can use PEP carboxykinase to turn that oxaloacetate into phosphorinopyruvate and then take that through gluconeogenesis to make glucose. Why does this make sense? Well, if you think about why you would be breaking down proteins and running the urea cycle, there's a couple of different scenarios. One is that you have just eaten a big meal, you have a lot of protein, and therefore you're going to want to store the carbons from that protein as glycogen. And so you can take that glucose 6-phosphate, you can do glycogenesis, link that up into glycogen, and store it. Another situation is that you're breaking down proteins because you need energy, you're starving, and in this case, the liver, it needs to supply glucose to the body. So it can take that glucose it makes and it can ship it out as glucose. And it can ship it out to the tissues who need it. So great, the liver is able to do its job, remove the amino groups safely and give fuel to the body or store fuel. Now you might be wondering though, weren't we trying to figure out how to keep this cycle going? Yes, but... There are also the carbon skeletons left over from those amino acids that you brought in. So our main amino acids that carry nitrogen groups through the bloodstream are going to be glutamine and alanine. So your muscles have this cool glucose alanine cycle and your other tissues are going to mainly use glutamine. So imagine you have an alanine and you remove the amino group. That's going to give you pyruvate. We know that pyruvate carboxylase can take that pyruvate and make oxaloacetate. We need oxaloacetate for the cycle. Voila. Because we can do the transamination in either the mitochondria or the cytoplasm because we can take aspartate in or out of the mitochondria. We just can't take oxaloacetate out, in or out of the mitochondria. So we can make oxaloacetate in the mitochondria, transaminate it in the mitochondria, take that out of the aspartate out of the mitochondria, and then do that the cycle out here. Or we can make the oxaloacetate in the cytoplasm and do the cycle over here. So we have options for how we get that oxaloacetate. And you're typically in your liver, it would be getting it from the skeletons of the amino acids that it brought in, rather than just taking this fumarate and getting the oxaloacetate from it. Because that oxaloacetate it gets from it is often going to be better used by the liver in order to do things like gluconeogenesis and to deliver glucose to the body or to store glucose as glycogen because it's going to have to do something with those amino acid skeletons anyway. And if it's already, you have this fumarate out here where it's needed, where you have these enzymes that can help make it glucose, that's going to be a better step. Less kind of gymnastics trying to get things in and out and trying to coordinate all the stuff. So not that simple bicycle, but one way or another, you are going to be able to regenerate that oxaloacetate to keep that cycle going.
You don't need to worry about regenerating the ornithine or the citrulline because those are getting regenerated in the cycle. The only things that you need to kind of worry about getting back is the soxaloacetate. And whatever you do, you're going to be left, though, with the carbon skeletons from those amino acids that you deaminated. So you're going to be left with an alpha keto acid where there's a ketone in the place of the amino group which the amino group was on the alpha carbon, so it was an alpha amino acid, and so now you have an alpha keto acid where your ketone is going to be on the alpha carbon. Depending on the amino acids we started with, we'll be left with different alpha keto acids, and these can be used for different purposes. So lots of cool things that you can do with amino acids, more on this elsewhere. But in order to actually do things with the carbon skeletons, we needed to have done the urea cycle in order to safely remove the nitrogen group of course, there are also things that we could do with the amino acids if we want something with the nitrogen. So again, more elsewhere. Lots of things with amino acids. The urea cycle is crucial to allowing you to use the amino acid skeletons without having to worry about ammonia building up.